decisions. So our first uh, speaker is uh, Professor Daniel Osorio, uh, and uh, Daniel's story is a story of color, uh, from studying the signals of different visual environments to how the animals see them, how their vision adapts and evolves over time. And throughout his academic time, he has studied a plethora of organisms, including and probably not limited to uh, butterflies, birds, primates, and cuttlefish, cephalopods. Um, Sussex is very happy to have Daniel here. He has been here since 1992, and he's uh, the director of the EB, Department of Evolution, Behavior, and Environment. And today he will be talking about cuttlefish, and he's a true representative of the diversity of research that happens in the life sciences. So without any further ado, Daniel. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. I can't see anything, so I can't look you in the eye. And um, I'd like to thank Lucia very much for her talk this morning. You know, she was unable to show a picture of these wonderful display courts produced by um, Japanese puffer fish. You can eat them afterwards and get a tetrodotoxin hit. But um, they produce these amazing, perfectly circular, um, regular spoke to rays. And if there's any sort of argument that there isn't some sense of aesthetics in um, non-human animals, I think this is a pretty good answer to it. So thank you very much for your, for your talk. And this links a bit to my talk, which is about the connection between perception and action. These are sometimes seen as distinct, particularly in the human literature, but really, especially from the point of view of animal behaviour, this is a false and somewhat mis misleading distinction. So what I'm going to be talking about is, of course, cuttlefish, these uh, cephalopods, which live off the end of Brighton Pier and around um, northwest Europe, and the Mediterranean, and you can see on their skin here these multiple dark spots which are called chromatophores, and they have a very complex multi-layered structure of three chromatophores and then other controllable materials beneath them in their, in their skin, and crucially each of these chromatophores is under direct motor neuronal control, essentially independent motor neuronal control from the, from the brain. So we have, if you like, a highly controllable behaviour that we're going to return to at the end of this talk expressed directly on the skin. And from my point of view as a vision scientist, what appealed to me about these, sorry, about these animals was the fact that they can do so much with this behaviour. This movie doesn't seem to work here, which is slightly annoying. Is there any... Forget about it. Anyway, what you, can see, what you would be, have been able to see here is that the cuttlefish attacks the crab next to it and dramatically changes its colour appearance very rapidly as many such movies on, on the web. From my point of view, as a vision scientist, it's the versatility of these animals, the ability to change their appearance according to the background upon which they're resting, primarily for camouflage, that give one, one direct access to spatial vision, the way in which they're seeing pattern, they're completely colourblind, so colour isn't involved, in order essentially to match the background, and they've evolved this behaviour under selection from the vision of fish. They evolved from relatively defended mollusks, such as nautilus and so on, they've given up these defences in exchange for, um, physical defences in exchange for coloration. Patterns. Can everybody see the two cuttlefish in the middle of the image there? So let's just take a quick step back. We've 
um, been hearing bad things about, about numbers and measurement in the early part of the meeting, but I think they're really important for actually taking objective views of stimuli and thinking about what there is out there in the world for the umwelts of other organisms to experience aside from our own human perception. So we have here a problem of how could we define, specify the visual characteristics of these moths. They all come from the same genus, so they're relatively closely related, quite common moths, and they have presumably evolved under natural selection by predators on birds in this, in this case. So they have effectively camouflaged on different types of subsets, substrates, perhaps uh, the tree barks that you can see on, on the left there, in which they rest during the day. And I'm talking about active behavioural responses um, in cuttlefish, but this can also be thought of as a problem in developmental biology, because we can imagine that it would at least be beneficial for evolution, for natural selection, to come up with a control system for wing patterns that allowed them to respond efficiently to the range and the nature of variation that we find in, say, the tree barks. And so we can imagine um, that there could be just a few genetic changes to go from a moth called the common Quaker to one called the Hebrew character, um, which allows these two species to occupy different niches. The, the, the common English names of moths are marvellous, marvellously picturesque, composed poetry just by putting them in sequence. Anyway, so this problem was, I think, addressed very clearly about 40 or 50 years ago um, by, by Bella Younes, who was a physicist and a psychophysicist who was really interested in camouflage. He's best known for his work on random dot stereograms. And so he thought, looking at moths and so on, that there must be some sort of simple low-dimensional account that could be produced of spatial patterns, which he, he analogised to our three-dimensional models of, of colour sp space, because we have red, green and blue cone photoreceptors in our eyes. He imagined that there could be essentially three or some roughly similar low number of spatial channels. And he also originated many of the ideas that we now um, refer to as image, image statistics. I was interested in describing mathematically the characteristics of different spatial patterns. And he came up what, with what was called texton theory, and he hopes to discover the sort of basis set of spatial representations represented by these textons um, that applied to human vision. And he was, in fact, unsuccessful. And so the point I want to make here is that this is a hard problem from the point of view of vision science. We do not have a simple low parameter model that allows us to specify in a way that so would interest and would satisfy someone interested in producing computer graphics, for example, the differences between these tree barks from the point of view of human vision and so, from the point of view of vision science, understanding how camouflage works and how it evolves under natural selection, or in the case of cuttlefish, how they choose their coloration patterns, is not straightforward at all. And just before we get back to cuttlefish, I will refer briefly to an experiment I did on another species that lives off the end of Brighton Pier, the common place fish, as in place and chips, 
And they're also very good at camouflaging themselves. They live all very similar kind of habitat, and they can produce a very wide range of patterns but by mixing a basis set of just two patterns, one of which is sort of blotchy and smooth, and the other is more punctate spots, and they can flexibly combine these two dimensions of variation to match effectively a range of background, the range of backgrounds on which they encounter. So now let's turn to cuttlefish camouflage. So as you probably know already, uh, cephalopods, octopus, squid and cuttlefish can produce a huge range of coloration patterns. They do this for communication and, of course, primarily, as I've said, for camouflage. And here we have a sort of diverse, somewhat frivolous um, examples named by, by Christopher Tyler and <clears throat> from work I'm going to refer to a little later. And I've mentioned the chromatophores. The chromatophore expression is normally coordinated centrally in the brain um, into 35 main components. So there's essentially 35 degrees of freedom in what these animals do can do to produce the range of coloration patterns that they actually use. That contrasts with the two degrees of freedom we just saw in the case of place. So we have about 35 components, and they're all fairly straightforwardly identifiable, which is very helpful for us. We don't have to use machine learning or anything of that kind to pick them out in the images. You can just get somebody to score them and their level of expressions fairly easily. So some of them are light, and some of them are dark. And you'll see these cropping up in the images I'm going to show as I go on. So, of course, we can see that in principle, they can produce some silly astronomical number of coloration patterns. And from what I've just been seeing, it's really is quite interesting to try and understand how they use the behave, this, this behavioural potential and how they coordinate their expression to match natural backgrounds. And, of course, we must assume that as this has evolved under natural selection, there's some sort of principle of efficiency here, so the fact they have two to the 35 possible patterns means that they might actually need to use them. And... I don't want to go into any detail here, but if we look at the correlation of expression of these different pattern components, then it's fairly clear, we can't absolutely prove that they can produce every possible pattern, but they seem to be able to express them independently of one another. So they are under fully independent control. There's no fixed sets of combinations that they, they need to use. So I'd now like to turn to the type of experiments we do, describe two sets of experiments, and then come to some overall synthesis at the end. So essentially what we do, and other groups working on these animals do, is to put, the anim put them on various artificial backgrounds with controlled visual properties. So here we can see um, an image from an experiment where we'll be looking at the animal's ability to perceive shape from shading, actually. But we can film them and we can score the expression of these components. And one of the th things that we discovered fairly on, early on, roughly um, 15 years ago now, was that they're very sensitive to whether the background seems to be composed of a continue, made of a continuous pattern surface, you know, such as gravel, fine gravel, or maybe weedy kind of rock, or is made of discrete objects, such as larger pebbles. 
So they have powerful mechanisms, that, very similar to ones that we seem to use in Gestalt psychology tells us we used for organising images into discrete objects. So we can see that the animal on the right here is doing something different from the two on the left because it's seeing those checkerboards as discrete objects and with various work analysing how they identify edges, which is a classic problem in computer vision and so on. And then one can for example, show that just as we see figures in these sort of Knitzer triangles and so on, the cuttlefish is doing something very similar and perceiving these type of figures as objects rather than isolated bits, bits of pattern. So essentially that's saying they have similar low-level edge and object uh, perceptual mechanisms to us. And uh, <clears throat> they also seem to use their patterns in a quite a categorical way. So we have what's called categorical perception in colour. For instance, we classify colours rather robustly as red, yellow or green, rather than seeing the, uh, the spectrum as a continuum under many circumstances. I did some experiments that were published with Alia el and others, where she looked at their ability, the cuttlefish's ability, to distinguish 3D objects, small pieces of plasticine, from 2D patterns that were very otherwise very similar, visually at least when seen from above with different types of shading and so on. And by producing a range of patterns, what one finds is that actually, despite quite considerable variation in the backgrounds, they seem to respond in very categorical, distinct ways between these 2D and 3D classes of background. So they're clearly not just physically matching the 2D background on which they're, sit they're sitting. So, in fact, there's quite a lot of literature to suggest that they express four main kinds of body patterns. They categorise the background into four main types, which are illustrated here. Um, so that leads to a model for pattern control, which implies that the cuttlefish are perhaps detecting low-level features in an image and then using that to if you like, cognitively produce some kind of categorical representation of the background of the scene in which they're sitting and then produce a body pattern accordingly. So just, I have to go rather, rather quickly now. We then did experiments to challenge this idea, which was suggested actually by Christopher Tyler. And what he did was, from our point of view, rather naive, he said, let's just put the animals on backgrounds that as closely as possible match it, matched individual pattern components. So they have black spot components, speckle components, so let's put them on a speckly background, a large white square, so let's put them on white squares, stripes, and so on. So we did that for various kinds of backgrounds, and... These are the images that we took, and they were then scored, and we then actually recorded patterns, components that were sufficiently significantly upregulated on these very uh, simple backgrounds compared to the back of those on a uniform background. And what we found was that in every case except E there, um, they tend to express relatively few components and, yeah, and they do, on the whole, more or less match the backgrounds. So the exception is E, which produce, where they express 11 different components that produce what's called the disruptive body pattern, the one they typically use on the pebbly background. 
and this is what this shows here as well. So what this led us to was the idea that essentially they have a two-level control system. They first of all are doing something like low-level feature matching and they may also have a higher level, if you like, more cognitive system for classifying the scene and producing these overall body patterns. And so that's what the experimental evidence was sort of telling us. And it turned out that this behaviour, I've just got one, one minute to go, um, very nicely matches work done by Gilles Rand, Sam Reiter, and their colleagues in Frankfurt, who cut out the first half of this system and just looked at the spontaneous activity of about 17,000 chromatophores and correlations in chromatophore um, activity. And this led them to a hierarchical model of pattern control. So there's a motor system which is organised hierarchically with um, gross body pattern organisation, a pattern component level of organisation, and then even subcomponent levels of organisation like this. So we have a hierarchical motor system, and we can see perhaps then how this might fit into our model of the visual behaviour, where we have a scene classification mechanism feeding into a high level of the motor control pathway and then feature matching fitting in lower down. So this, I can't, don't have time now to go through that, but this reminded me very much of ideas of more traditional motor control where we have animals sometimes producing stereotyped movements, gates, for example, as we can see on the right here, and also the ability to finally tune responses according to much more specific sensory inputs. And with that, I will thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this very interesting talk. Uh, in the interest of time, we will only take one short question, if there is one. There is a hand there. Someone can pass a microphone, please. You just need to turn it on. Oh. Hello there. Uh, Hello. Th thanks very much, Daniel, for a very interesting talk. Um, there's just one observation I'd like to make, and that is, um, are you not assuming that uh, the visual systems of the other predators of the cuttlefish are the same as the human visual system by which you are making your analyses? No, I, I'm not assuming that because I'm just measuring what the cuttlefish are doing and then we could analyse the spatial characteristics of, the, of these uh, patterns and see if there's any difference between what you know, seems to be coming out from that modelling and what we see as humans. However, having said that, you know, all the evidence from the beauty of camouflage um, is that, at least if we're thinking about spatial vision rather than colour, the vision of fish and birds and so on is remarkably similar to that of, of, to our own, and that's presumably because it's been driven by the same sort of general constraints of seeing a world made of discrete objects with particular types of lighting and physical properties and so on. In which these other predators have developed um, leave open the possibility that their visual systems will have developed according to their settings. I'm sure they have. And clearly there's, there's important differences. Many of these animals can see polarisation, for example, which we're, we're bl blind to. But it's really hard, you know, having worked in this field for more than 30 years now, to point to some clear difference in spatial vision, how we see low-level features or edges and objects and so on that actually seems to differ between um, 
ourselves and other animals? And this is one of the questions that got me into this subject because at the time, and maybe still now, there were ideas that the way in which we see objects and make sense of the world is heavily dependent on, you know, the kind of processing that we can do in our cerebral cortex, which many of these animals have, or to a much lesser degree, don't have. Let's thank Daniel once again.